Hey, thank you for being with us again. We're, uh, we've got a lot of good things going on. I want to welcome you to our family. We want to remind you of what we're here for. want to remind you of who we are. want to remind you of what we believe. want to remind you of what we care about. And so please keep those things in mind as you come and be a part of this family. We've got a house full. It's great. Summertime. People on vacation. Look at everybody's here. Isn't it great? Yes? Oh, come on. I, you guys haven't been on vacation yet, have you? I can tell some of you haven't because you got that hangdog look that says, man, I don't know what you're so excited about today. But that's all right. I've had my vacation, so. Anyway, it is good to have you with us. Would you join me in our confession together? Oh, by the way, remind you of Vacation Bible School, just in case you forgot, 6 to 8 tonight through Wednesday night. Would you join with me in our confession? I am a child of God. I am saved by grace. I live each day by faith. I'm ready to hear God's word. I hope you are. Hey, dude. He's ready. We stand for the reading of the word of God. Our reading this morning is from Acts 11, verses 1 to 18. Let me share this with you, and then we will go straight to our lesson. Reminder again to our kids, you'll be in here with us today. Try to be nice, not drive your parents crazy. Here we go. The Bible says, The apostles and the brothers throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him and said, You went into the house of uncircumcised men and ate with them. Peter began and explained everything to them precisely as it had happened. I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in, the trance, I, in a trance I saw a vision. I saw something like a large sheep being let down from heaven by its four corners, and it came down to where I was. And I looked into it and saw four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, reptiles, and birds of the air. Then I heard a voice telling me, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. I replied, Surely not, Lord. Nothing impure or unclean has ever entered my, my mouth. The voice spoke from heaven a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times, and then it was all pulled up to heaven again. Right then, three men who had been sent to me from Caesarea stopped at the house where I was staying. The Spirit told me to have no hesitation about going with them. These six brothers uh, also went with me, and we entered into the man's house. He told us how he had seen an angel appear to his house, in his house and said, Send a Joppa for Simon, who's called Peter. He'll bring you a message through which you and all your household will be saved. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit came on them, as he had come on us at the beginning. Then I remembered what the Lord had said. John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So if God gave them the same gift as he gave us who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to think that I could oppose God? And when they heard this, they had no further objections. And they praised God, saying, So then, God has granted even the Gentiles repentance unto life. May God bless this reading of his word, the church said. Amen, Amen, church. Have a seat. Let's go to work. We're going to look at a lesson today, and and we're continuing through the first 12 chapters of Acts in a series called Pictures of the Early Church. God just lets us see on a very fundamental level what early Christians were like, what they were doing. Great example for us, and nothing better than the passage we're looking at today. How do Christians solve their differences? Wow, the million-dollar question, right? How do we work our problems out? And I'm convinced that one of the reasons we have so many problems is because we don't work them out the way God. God just shows you how to do it. He just lays it out there. Somebody says, what's your doctrine of conflict resolution? I don't need doctrine of conflict resolution. Look at at the way Christians, why why does God give us these stories? So we can look at them and say, oh, okay, that's how you do it. And you know something? It's not rocket science. It's interesting that this whole story of conflict resolution is told in 18 verses. Not 18 chapters. This is not a course in conflict resolution. Now, there's even a better one in Acts 15 that, Lord willing, someday we'll look at. But 
But here in chapter 11, in 18 verses, these people hammer out one of the most important decisions that could be made in the history of the early church. This event could have easily torn the church wide open. Could have easily aborted the whole movement very quickly because something absolutely radical took place in chapter 10 and chapter 11, by the way, Peter's statements in verses 4 to 10 is a fantastic summary of Acts 10. But let's look at this passage and see what we can learn from it. Let's set the stage, get a little back. I would, I would recall for you, three weeks ago, we finished up our study of Acts 10, working through that chapter of the Bible. And you remember that in Acts 10, what did Peter do? He baptized the first Gentiles. Gentiles, there were two in, in the Bible's way of thinking. There are two groups of people in the world. Now, we would say, yes, there's sinners and, and the righteous. No, 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 no. In Jesus' day, there were two groups of people. There were Jews and there were non-Jews. Jews and Gentiles, the goyim, the dirty ones, the dogs, the untouchables. Jews despised Gentiles. Even the most moderate, even the most open-minded Jews realized that Gentiles were a bad influence. The more strict Jews, and there evidently were some converted to Christ, the, the stricter the Jew, the more he hated the Gentiles, to the point that among some within the Jewish community, the question of table fellowship was important. Who do you eat your meals with? If we were to translate it into the church here, we might say, well, you know, the only people you're allowed to eat meals with are other Christians. You can't eat meals with anybody that is not a Christian. In fact, you don't even need to be in a place where non-Christians are having meals together, which would really hurt most of us because it would take out all the good restaurants. But anyway, you know, you don't do that. And the reason is because when you go eat with Gentiles, you never know what they're going to serve. They might, they might whip up a pork tenderloin, which would be delicious, but as a Jew, I couldn't eat it. They might serve catfish. I love catfish, but as a Jew, I can't eat that stuff. So, this, be, this is a big issue in the Judaism of Jesus' day. Well, you know something? When you become a Christian, you don't just forget everything you've learned. Do we? I mean, the goal is to grow and to learn and to get more like a real Christian that we ought to be. But let's face it, we all have baggage. Everybody brings their baggage. Even those of us that have grown up in the church. Because there's a lot of diversity in the church. And a lot of times when you come from somewhere else or you come from another church or you come from outside and you come in, you know, all of a sudden people are doing things weird and they're using funny words and they're saying things different and they don't, they don't read the same way you do and the preacher looks strange and does weird stuff and, you know, we just don't get it. And it's like, what's that all about? And it's easy to let our tradition that we've grown up with dominate our love for Jesus and his church. And that's a dangerous territory to get into. Now, you talk about dropping a bombshell. This guy baptizes some Gentiles. Well, what's the problem with that? Well, let me see if I can describe it. Jesus was a Jew. Peter, Andrew, James, and John were Jews. All 12 apostles were Jews. The women who traveled with Jesus were Jews. The 120 disciples in Acts 2 that gathered in the upper room were Jews. All those people that received the Holy Spirit in Acts 2 were Jews. Everybody converted in Acts 2. What, 3,000? Guess what? All Jews. Everybody converted in the first eight chapters of Acts were Jews. Saul of Tarsus was converted in chapter 9. Guess what? He's a Jew. They're all Jews. 
Somebody says, no, they're all Christians. Yeah, I get that. They're all Jews. And it's obvious that there were many in the early church who not only followed Jesus but continued to practice very devoutly their Jewish practices, their traditions, the foods they ate, the way they dressed, the way they talked, the places they went. And you know something Paul says in Romans 12 that he's cool with that. He says, hey, if a brother wants to keep special days to the Lord, what's he talking about? He's talking about the Sabbath. He's talking about Passover. He's talking about the Feast of Tabernacles. He's talking about Pentecost. He says if a brother wants to practice those things while he's still serving Jesus, let him alone. He's doing that between him and God. Leave the guy alone and let him do it. But he says if a fellow understands, as we do as Christians, that all days are the same to God, and he doesn't practice any of those days, then he says, let the guy that practices them keep his big mouth shut and leave the other guy alone too because the other guy doesn't have to keep them. If you choose to keep them, fine, keep them. Don't knock the other guy. He says, some guys eat anything. Some guys only eat certain foods. So what? He says, the kingdom of God is not about the kind of food you eat. The most important thing is not what you eat. It's who you serve. Those are very important principles that we still have trouble wrapping our heads around. You know? So, when Peter gets to Jerusalem, guess what? He gets called out. He gets called out. He is called upon to justify what he's doing. And that leads me to my first point in the first three verses of this chapter. And that is that traditions are often a cause of division. We more often divide over what we grew up with than over what the Bible teaches. That's what we fight over. Well, you don't use the right translation. Oh, really? Well, which translation should they use in France? Which English translation is acceptable in France? Oh, I'm sorry. They speak French, don't they? Yeah. What translation in English should you use in Saudi Arabia? Or South Africa? Or Norway? See how silly that becomes? You know, that's like I had a friend tell me one time, he says the biggest problem they had back in the 1960s was sending Southern Baptist missionaries to Northern Rhodesia in Africa because they kept trying to convince the people of Northern Rhodesia to become Southern Baptists. And they didn't get that. It's like, what? Especially since Northern Rhodesia had arisen out of a civil war with Southern Rhodesia and to tell them to be a Southern anything was not good. Now see, that's a case where American tradition tries to override what's going on in a, a completely foreign culture. And that's why God made so few rules about those kinds of things, is so that we could take the gospel to all men. And so that's what's going on here. Now, leaving Caesarea, Peter and the others returned to Jerusalem. It's about 45 miles by foot it's a rather arduous journey. Would have taken two or three days. But you know something that I, I love about this passage? It's one of those little things that's kind of hidden between the lines that jumps out at you. And that is the fact that the church, the grapevine in the early church was just as good as the one is in the church today. By the time they get to Jerusalem, everybody in the church knows what's happened at Caesarea. And how did they find out? It wasn't like somebody in Caesarea picked up the cell phone and said, Hey, Jimmy, you're not going to believe what just happened. It's not like it was on the news that night or somebody posted it on, oh, you know, that's what it was. Peter posted a little video on Facebook of him baptizing Cornelius and the brethren all watched it on the Peter, a ministry of, of the Apostle Peter channel. And it was like, oh, hey, what's that all about? I don't know how they found out, but by the time... Three or four days later, by the time Peter and the other six that traveled with him get to Jerusalem, everybody in the church in Jerusalem, including all the apostles, the Bible says, know what's happened. They know that they've baptized this Gentile. Isn't it great? You know, let somebody in the church here do something a little unorthodox, and everybody in the whole county knows about it in about two hours. So, you know. Somebody says, that really bothers me. It doesn't bother me. It's been going on since the first century. 
It's interesting, isn't it? So what happens? Well, they arrive and they are immediately called on the carpet. They're questioned. It says that, well, let's look at it. Let's look at it again. What does it say? The apostles and the brothers throughout Judea. Notice the word apostles. Part of this criticism of Peter is leveled by the other apostles. Was there any internal dissension within the church? Was there any ego involved within the church? Was there any disagreement sometimes even between leaders? Well, of course there was. They're people. People do that kind of stuff. And even though their concern is about the keeping of a tradition, it is a, an honestly felt concern. It says that them and some of the brothers heard that Gentiles had received the word of God. So Peter went to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers. Now that's a weird statement from Luke because all the believers were circumcised except for Cornelius. But I think what he's suggesting here is that there were those within the early church around Jerusalem especially who were maybe a little more conservative Jewishly. And they had come to Jesus and they're, you know, I don't think everybody in the Jerusalem church continued to practice Jewish things, but I think some did. And it's that group that is concerned. Now, is it a fair concern? Sure it is. They don't understand. They've not been through the visions that Peter's been through. They've not had the miraculous outpouring of the Holy Spirit on unbelievers that Peter witnessed. They haven't been party to any of that. Isn't it interesting how easy it is to judge somebody when you don't know what's happened? They're good guys. They're sincere. They're wanting to do what's right, and they believe with honest hearts that in keeping the food laws and not eating with Gentiles, they're pleasing God. That's cool. They don't know that God's changed the rules. By the way, a week earlier, Peter didn't know it either. And it took a miracle from God to get him to change. <laughs> Imagine what it's going to take with these guys. So they, some of the Jewish brethren question him. And they, what they question is this. They don't question whether he can baptize. This blows my mind. They don't question him baptizing the guy. They just say, why would you eat with him? And that's why I go back to the thing at the top of the, of the chart here. See the thing at the very top? What are they willing to argue about? They're not arguing over doctrine. They're not arguing over whether or not you baptize Gentiles. They're arguing over whether you can have dinner with them. Because the assumption is that if you eat dinner at a Gentile's house, especially a Roman Gentile, he's going to serve something you shouldn't eat. He's going to throw out a pork chop. He's going he's to grill some bacon. Something's going to hit that table that you shouldn't eat. Now, how do you deal with that? And to some of these brethren, misinformed as they are, but they're very sincere, that really bothers them. They're concerned. But it says they criticized him. That's a pretty strong term, isn't it? So do we have a potential division going on here? Well, it depends on how it's handled. And that's why I say that the second part of this story reminds me that when differences occur, you have to rely on two things. Number one, get the facts. Well, now my cousin Frankie told me, I don't care what your cousin Frankie said. If you want to know what I taught, you come talk to me about it. I'll tell you. You want to know what I believe? Come and talk to me. I'll tell you. If I'm not honest enough to tell you, then that tells you right there that there's something wrong. You know, one of the things the Bible absolutely demands that we almost never practice in the church is absolute, total honesty with each other as Christians. Absolute honesty with each other. Did you go to such and such a place? Well, now the answer is either yes, I did, or no, I didn't. You don't need a 20-minute lecture on philosophy. I either went or I didn't. You know, 
did you say so and so? It's a yes or no question. Either I said or it gets me. These guys, will, these politicians will say stuff. And then they get called out on it, and then they'll say, well, I was misinterpreted. Let me tell you something, son. From what you said, there ain't no misinterpreting. What you said is what you said. If I look at somebody and say, you're ugly, don't tell me I misinterpreted. I called you ugly. I called you ugly. That's the word I used. Well, I didn't mean that. Well, then why did you use the word? You know, most of us are smart enough to know the right words to say what we want to say. If the grass needs cutting, you know, somebody goes up and says, hey, you need to cut the grass. There ain't a whole lot of interpretation on that. I don't have to have a degree in Greek to figure out what that means. But we're so used to lying to each other, we're so used to hedging our conversations that we play word games with each other, and that's just so ungodly in the kingdom. It just doesn't need to be happening. And we do it internally and we do it externally. It's all the way around. Four remarkable things. It, Peter says, okay, you want to know what happened? I'm going to give you the facts. And I appreciate the fact that the brethren sat there and they shut their mouths and they let the guy speak. He didn't say the first thing. He said, now wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. What does that mean? They let him tell his story. Tell us what happened. He says, okay, here it comes. And he gives it to him. And it's interesting that in, in this entire story that Peter has from verses 4 to 17, the central figure is not Peter and it's not Cornelius. It's God. He constantly talks about God's interjection of himself into the situation to make it happen. And that gives it the ring of authority. When God says do it, then, you know, it's not a matter of, well, yeah, but I have a different opinion. I don't really care what your opinion is. If God says it's okay to do it, it's okay to do it. And so you're going to find out real quick how honest Peter is, and number two, you're going to find out how honest Christians are that are listening to him. Are they willing to accept the facts and listen to what God says? And there, just real quick, let me give you this. There are four things Peter recounts. Number one, he shares the divine vision he received. Remember that, the sheet let down in the corners. And in fact, he reminds him. He says, hey, it's not like it's, you know, it's not like I'm, I'm not like you. He says, you know, it's not like you and I don't see the same. I mean, I, I, I hear what you're saying. God had to drop this thing on me three times before I finally got it. So he says, I, I hear what, what Peter's saying is what? I hear your concern. I had the same concern. God had to hit me in the head with it three times to get me to hear him. I hear that. He talks about the sheet, talks about the unclean meats on it, talks about how God commanded him to eat. Now, the first thing God commands is, is an external thing. You can eat these meats. But Peter begins to realize as the story unfolds, God's also talking about an internal thing. Oh, by the way, not only can you eat these meats, you can fellowship these people. Because basically the truth of the matter is the kingdom of God is not about me. It's about you and me and how we relate to each other. So Peter then recounts the divine command. He says God said so. Notice what it says in, in verses 11 and 12. He says, right then three men who had been sent from Caesarea stopped at the house where I was staying. And the spirit told me not to hesitate to go with them. Well, I don't think you should have. Well, excuse me. But the Holy Spirit of God said to him, these three men are going to knock at the door. If they ask you to go somewhere, go with them. Were they Jews? The answer is no. They were Gentiles. One of them, my guess is, was probably a military man. I would say probably a soldier and two servants from the household of Cornelius sent from his Gentile household to the city of Joppa to fetch Peter. Why? Because God told him to. Peter doesn't tell us that yet because Peter doesn't know it yet. Peter says, three men knocked on the door. God had already told me to go with them, not ask any questions. He says, without hesitation. That's how God wants us to obey him, by the way, isn't it? Without hesitation. Then Peter recalls the divine planning. Peter begins to realize as he participates in these events 
that somebody's pulling the strings besides Peter. In fact, Peter has nothing to do with this. Thing. He's just going where he's told to go and doing what he's told to do and being what he's told to be. God's pulling all the strings. And so what does he say in verses 13 and 14? He says, he told us how he'd seen an angel. He says, we went to this guy's house. He told us how he'd seen an angel. Okay, now, what does that tell you? God's involved on both ends. Peter's already had this visit, visit from God. Now Cornelius says, oh, well, listen, I don't know why I sent to you other than I had this vision from God. An angel told me. Well, now, Peter's not a rocket scientist, but he's putting these pieces together pretty quick. He says, okay, I have a vision from God three times. That guy has a vision from God. The men that came to my house were sent by that guy on the command of God, and I'm going with them on the command of God. Hey, you know something? I think God wants this to happen. You know, I think God wants this to happen. And he says, he says send to Joppa for Simon. He'll bring you a message. And then he changes it a little bit through which you and your household will be saved. So Peter says, the guy told me, God wants me to come down and preach salvation to him. Now, you know, at that point, the case is becoming overwhelming. So then he describes the divine actions. He says, God has, God has sent visions. God has given commands. God has done all the planning, and we can see his hands moving all the pieces together. And then on top of everything else, God literally drops the Holy Spirit bombshell right in the middle of the congregation, right in the middle of the family. And he says, I hadn't even baptized him yet. It's like God was accelerating the schedule here a little bit. And Peter makes no bones about it. He says, this is exactly the same thing that we experienced on the day of Pentecost. Notice what he says. He says, as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit came on them. Listen to this. As he had come on us and at the beginning. beginning. The, the beginning, beginning of what? what? The, beginning the beginning of the church. Of the church. Yeah. Acts 2, 1 to 4. <coughs> the Holy Spirit fell upon them in cloven tongues of fire, and they were each filled with the Holy Spirit. And he says, you know, guess what? So, were there cloven tongues of fire? I think you have to argue that probably there were, because Peter immediately recognizes, hey, that, uh, you know, this is deja vu all over again. He's been here and done this stuff. Except now it's not falling on him. He's already anointed. Now it's falling on these Gentiles. And he says, you know, then, and, and he says not only that, but then look what he does. Who does he quote from? He quotes from Jesus, doesn't he? He says, the minute I saw the Holy Spirit fall on them like it did on us, then I remembered what Jesus had said. By the way, what did Jesus say the Holy Spirit would do later on once Jesus had left earth and he filled us with the Holy Spirit? Doesn't it say he will bring to your remembrance all those things I have commanded you? Guess what? Divine jogging of the memory here. He says, then I remembered what Jesus said. When Jesus said, I baptize you with water. Or John said, I baptize you with water, but Jesus will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And he says, we understood that in Acts 2. Well, now I get it in Acts 10. When he says he will baptize you, he wasn't just talking about you, me, and you. He was talking about everybody. The gospel is for, you know, if they were in the 20th, 21st century church, they'd all break into a chorus of the gospel is for all. It would be perfect. And so he describes the actions. And he says, now, God has given us visions. He's given us commands. He's shown his planning. And he's acted. And so what does he say? He says, who was I to think that I could oppose God? Now, what's interesting is, is verse 18 says, and then they said, well, we still have this questionnaire we'd like you to fill out because we're concerned about your views on some other things as well. So while we're at it, let's just do a full-scale inquisition, go down the list and see how many things, you know, we want to make sure we have some questions about your soundness now. The guy says, listen, these are the facts. Is he completely honest about it? He just lays it out there. Amen. And he tells him, he says, I had my doubts just like you have your doubts. This is what happened. This is what the Lord did. And look at this beautiful verse 18. It says, when they heard this, they shut up. Amen. Now, that's my translation. But it says they had no further objections. They shut their, well, actually, they didn't shut their mouths. 
What did they do? They praised God. How come we can't praise God? Even when we have differences? How come we can't praise God when God acts in situations and does good things? It's just so sad. The third truth is that facts plus truth equals unity. We just got to get everybody on board with that. Let me give you two quickies. Number one, as a Christian, and this is, this is really the, the heart of what we're talking about here as far as how to solve these things. As a Christian, what does Peter model? Transparency. He has no agenda. He has nothing to hide. He says, I'm going to tell you what God said. I'm going to tell you what Cornelius said. I'm going to tell you what the men visiting said. I'm going to tell you what I said and did. I'm just going to lay the facts out. You're honest. Christians, you can judge for yourselves. I'm just going to give it to you. Just to give, give you the facts. Here's what happened. Now, how did the others react? Well, as Christians, the others were willing to listen and learn. They kept their mouth shut and listened to what the men did. Let the guy finish. And then they didn't say, well, okay, well, uh, we've got this, but now we want to ask you about that. That's not the issue. This is the issue. Let's stick with the issue. The issue is, can you eat at table with Gentiles? Peter's argument is, according to the will of God, I can bring them into the kingdom and fellowship them as brothers, and fellowshipping as brothers, by definition, includes table fellowship. Why is that? Because clear back in Acts 2, what does it say? It says, they continue steadfastly in the apostles' teaching, in the fellowship, in the breaking of bread, and in prayers. And what does the next verse say? And house to house, they visited with each other and did what? Took meals together. From the very beginning, what do Christians do? They have table fellowship. So, common sense. If it's okay for Cornelius to be a Christian, it's okay to have table fellowship with him. Why? Because the one's the other and the other's the one. Duh. Well, that's not what we grew up with. God's not interested in what you grew up with. That has nothing to do with anything. You know? How many of you put butter on your grits? Come on, raise your hand now. Be honest. How many, of you put, how many of you put sugar on your grip? You put them both? I uh, see, I grew up in a place where you put sugar on your grits, and I was told in some places you go to hell for that. You got to put butter on your grits. I'm going to tell you something, folks. The things that sometimes divide us as Christians are just about as silly as whether you put sugar or butter on your grits. I even know of some people who don't eat grits. <laughs> and let me tell you something else, and this is going to stun some of you who've never been much out of this area. You realize if you go north of the Mates and Dixon line, you ask for sweet tea, they say, what's that? <laughs> That's why I've never left Tennessee. <laughs> Once I got down here and found out about sweet tea, I ain't going nowhere they don't have sweet tea. I just go back home. Well, you sweeten your own. Uh-uh. God never meant somebody to meant me to sweeten my own. See what we do, though? Here's our conclusion. Stay with me. This is very important, though, isn't it? This is important stuff. Look at this. What does this passage teach us? It teaches us that honest Christians, if they cherish unity, can sit down and work their differences out. Yes. Now, you show me somebody that can't do that, and I'll show you somebody who's not filled with the Spirit of God. <coughs> and getting dunked in water doesn't fill you in the Spirit of God. Once you're baptized, you've got to be open. You've got to be submissive to God. You've got to let God lead you. Not in some mysterious hocus-pocus way, but through this word and through it teaches what it teaches. The examples he gives us, God says, look, why do you think I put chapter 10 in and then put chapter 11 in right on the heels of it? Because I want you to see how Christians work it out. And the fact that Christians do work it out, whether it's in marriage, 
whether it's in family, whether it's in wor at work, whether it's in church. Notice the word honest, though. You've got to be honest about it. And everybody's got to come to the table. Now, you get somebody that, even if they call themselves a Christian, you get somebody that behaves in an unchristian way, then, you know, you can't expect it to work out God's way when you're not doing it God's way. That's why it's, it's behold, we're all beholden to the fact that we need to really get into the Word and understand the kind of character, the kind of attitudes, the kind of human relationships that God wants us to foster. We need to really work at making those what they should be. Because we've all got baggage and we've all got flaws and we all are human. But God can overcome all of that. Amen. It's just a matter of submission to his will. So that's Acts 11, 1 to 18. Next week, Lord willing, we're going to look, or two weeks from now, we're going to look at, at, at a, a new church that, that just, God plants a new church in the middle of nowhere, and it just blows up and becomes the missionary center of the first century world. Another case of God meddling in order to get his will done. Isn't it a wonderful thing to see God's hand moving in a church and moving in the lives of people? If you're not a Christian, well, you know, and, and none of us are perfect, but, you know, you at least got to get there. You got to get started. If you're not a Christian, if you've never come to Jesus like everybody does in the book of Acts, it's always the same. They hear the gospel story of Jesus. They realize Jesus died on the cross for their sins. They put their faith in that. They say, hey, I can't go to heaven without him. I'm willing to leave the life I'm living. I'm willing to confess my love for him. If he wants me to be baptized in his death, burial, and resurrection, if he wants me to go through my death, death, death burial, and resurrection to get there, I'm good with it. Let's do it right now. Yeah. It's what Cornelius did. Amen. It's what Saul did. It's what the Ethiopian did. It's what the, what the, 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 uh, it's what people in all generations have done. Jesus said the promise was for all generations. If you're not a Christian, we encourage you to make that decision. You let us know. We'll meet you here, anywhere, anytime. we we'll take care of that. If you're a Christian, hey, Anybody feel the need for a prayer closet right now? I might need to go home and spend a little time in the prayer closet. That's okay. That's what those are for. You let God drive you to your knees, and God will change your heart. If you need to make a decision this morning, we encourage you to do it while we stand.